Whenever you're ready, Mr. Page. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. The Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City proceedings will begin. The Board is now in session. If you're in possession of any type of electronic device, please place said device on the off or silent mode during proceedings. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, there have been no preliminary matters on the AM docket or are there? No. Want to call case number two yes. first? Okay, we're going to go with case number two. Regional American Sandwiches, 2400 Boston Street, Suite 120. This is a Class B beer, wine, and liquor license, an application for a new Class B beer, wine, and liquor restaurant license under Article 12-903, small c, number two, small i, small i, small i, requiring 500000 in capital investment and facilities, 51% food sales, seating capacity for 75, but not more than 150 individuals. Uh, this is a request for outdoor table service and delivery of alcoholic beverages. Please come forward. Council. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, David F. Mr. Mr. Winter Bartlett representing the applicants today. I have a, uh, I think, a relatively demonstrative exhibit. Thank you. With regard to those. Before you do, can I ask the gentleman to raise their right hands, please? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, Mr. Mister. Thank you. Um, Region Ale uh, has uh, an existing location in Ellicott City in Howard County. They've been operating there without any violations for several years. They, this is an opportunity to expand. Uh, my client, and his, there's a principal client, uh, Mr. Curley, has his biography in here, and he has, uh, he's both a culinary school graduate as well as the Cornell School of- uh, Is that you, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Restaurant and <laughs> hospitality. So he has a substantial educational experience in this area, but he also now has the real world life experience of running the restaurant uh, in, uh, in Ellicott City. We've, he's put together, and I would say his education served him well because he put together, I think, a really nice presentation uh, here, uh, which contains both the menu at the beginning and his business plan, um, which we won't go through chapter and verse, but uh, I think maybe the most, most important thing is at page, well, the pages aren't numbered. Yep. Mine are, at the bottom. Um, yeah, the business plan is numbered. Oh, looking at <laughs> operating projections or yes. capital budget? Yeah, we're, we're looking at the capital budget, uh, two back. which is- Just after the business plan, it's probably 25 or 30 pages in. You have four pages from the back, uh, or five pages from the back, oh. which. Um, okay. What pages? Oh. Yes. yes. Capital budget starts right there. Yep. Yeah, got it. And that's just showing. Uh, Thank you. That we're reaching over the five hundred thousand dollar threshold for the capital budget. Is it true, Mr. Curley, that you anticipate that you will be expending five hundred fifty-three thousand three hundred forty-seven dollars and sixteen cents? as of this time? Yes, it is, yes. Okay, and obviously you know we've talked about the fact that you will have to submit actual invoices or paid receipts uh, to establish this to the board's satisfaction before the license is issued. Yes. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us a little bit about w your concept and, and uh, what, your, what your business plan is. Yeah, sure, so the first region I'll open in November 2016, so it's a fast casual sandwich shop, so the menu's a big map of the United States with famous sandwiches from all around the country, so. Maryland Crab Cake, Florida Cubano, Louisiana Shrimp Po' Boy. Pretty limited menu. Uh, we also have uh, sides, soup, salads, everything's made in house. Just kind of trying to be a little bit of an elevated version of uh, say a Jimmy John's or a Potbelly, something a little more unique, a little nicer. And I think Canton is a really good fit for the second location um, in terms of businesses in the area for lunch as well as residential at night. The board may be familiar with it, but this is the American Can Building in Canton, where, of course, there's a sort of a, a restaurant park there already existing. Uh, the last page of, of the uh, piece is the floor plan. And, Mr. Curley, how many uh, seats total um, do you anticipate? 92 seats total, and that's not including any bar seating. So 92 full seats. So who's going to be operating uh, both of these locations, you? Uh, so I'm going to have operating partners at both locations. I would assume I'm going to be mostly in Canton. Regi uh, regional and Ellicott City is pretty much uh, operationally, you know, sufficient at this point, and 
and uh, runs pretty well without me. So, uh, for the the board's information, uh, while he has not spent enough time to qualify yet, um, my client, Mr. Curley, has actually moved to Baltimore City uh, and and is residing in Federal Hill, mm -hmm. and uh, so he's going to be here most of the time and will be nearby, so he will be able to hands-on manage the operation. This other gentleman, the uh, resident? He's the resident agent. You And your name, sir? Uh, Eric Van Castle. Okay. And Mr. Van Castle is correct. He's not, not going to actually be involved operationally. He's serving as, strictly as the resident uh, resident license. How many city. employees do you have, Mr. Curley? Uh, at the current location or foreseeing it, it currently. another? Currently. Uh, about 16 currently. And you but expect a similar number? Uh, uh, probably not quite double, but probably around 25 employees. It's about double the square footage as the original location. And well, how many will be handling alcohol? Um, probably eight of those employees will be handling and alcohol. Will they be certified? Yeah, TIP certified, yep. Are you TIP certified? I am, yes. And how many seats outdoors? Are, so we outdoor? haven't quite figured that out. It's, it's not really the greatest outdoor setup. It's in a bit of a strip mall, so maybe three or four tables at the most, maybe 10 seats at the most we could probably fit out there. Now, which location was this at the can company? Was this the former? Uh, Pasticcio's. Okay. So it's in line with the, uh, so it goes Chipotle, exactly. clothing okay. store, Pasticcio. Right. Yeah. Got it. The, the one thing that's somewhat unique about this, although I know the board has seen and approved this before, is they're going to have a pour system there, an automatic pour system. Talk a little bit about that. I think Yeah, the, sure. And, and all the information's it's stapled. It's in the back there. Mm -hmm. It should be behind the last page right there. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're working with a company. There's already uh, a poor system in the Camden Yards Marriott using this system, and there's a few in Baltimore County and, and south. But it's essentially, it's poor my beer, so it's a, a, a large beer wall with iPad screens and taps. And then the customer, when they come in, they'll check with the cashier. They have to scan their ID to make sure they're over 21. And then that allows them to essentially open a tab where the beer wall will be. Uh, representative from Region A will be standing at the beer wall at all times. Um, so you put the little card on the iPad tap and it unlocks and allows you to pour up to, th uh, usually, you know, you can pour a full beer, 16 ounces, but you can pour up to 32 ounces until it cuts you off. So it, so over service is never an issue with this. Um, you need a username and password. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the, the, the card is linked to, to the license at all times. So it's, it's a pretty, they've never had any issues with underage drinking because everyone is scanning and checking an ID. And I think it's actually a little bit more responsible than just having a really busy bar with a bartender because it's actually tracking how much that customer is drinking and just prevents over service. One of the little blocks on there shows the various states where this has been approved um, nationally and it's the overwhelming majority. Although I was surprised that the very liberal state of Vermont has not yet approved it, but uh, um, the uh, got to talk to Bernie. <laughs> 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 um, okay. Uh, well, that's very interesting. Um, commissioners have other questions. Oh, community association. It sounds like you went to them and they're on yep. board. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. No questions. Nothing else. Anything else. Anything else, Mr. Mister? No, that would be all. We just asked okay. the board to approve this subject to your usual and customary checklist items. Thank you. So on the basis then of the materials contained in your application, <coughs> um, the proffer from counsel and your testimony as well as the exhibit which will be received in evidence, um, I would vote to approve uh, the application for a new Class B beer, wine, and liquor restaurant license with outdoor table service and delivery of alcoholic beverages. I vote to approve the application for a new Class B beer, wine, and liquor with outdoor table service and delivery of alcoholic beverages. I too uh, vote to approve the new Class B beer, wine, and liquor license with outdoor table service and de delivery of alcoholic beverages. Good luck. Good Thank luck. You very much. I Thank you. Thank you. I call this for the record. What is it? One letter of support from Canton Community Association. Applicant is it? One business plan. Mr. Mister. Only case number one on the AM docket, <coughs> Tandave 1725 East Lombard Street, Class B, beer, wine, and liquor license, an application for a new Class B, 
beer, wine, and liquor restaurant license under Article 12-903, small c, number 2, small i, requiring 500000 in capital investment in facilities, seating capacity for 75, but not more than 150 individuals. Please come forward. Would you first all raise your right hands, please? Okay, and um, who's the uh, lead on this? I'll be the lead. I'm the applicant. I'm Lawrence Oliva. Mr. Oliva. So you want to tell us about it? Sure. Uh, this uh, license application is for a Class B at Tandev, and Tandev is an Indian restaurant located at 1725 East Lombard Street. It's been in operation approximately a year at this point at that location, um, and it serves Indian food, obviously. Do we have your budget and uh, expenditures, or do you, have you brought them? Sorry. We don't have the budget of 500,000. We do not have the sitting capacity of 75. Before you, can you t step up, ma'am, please, and give us Sorry. your name? We do not have your the... Your name, please. Your name. Uh, we're on the record, so we need your name. Tell me your name. Sorry. It's uh, Nikki uh, Navdashni Mathur. I'm Anil's wife, oh. the business owner's wife. Uh, this gentleman needs to get it. Nikki Mathur? So Navdash... Yes. yes. And you're Nikki? Navdashni Mathur. N-A-V-D-A-R-S-H-I-N-I, M-A-T-H-U-R. And thank you, Ms. Mather. So th what were you telling us about the budget? Sir, we do not have the budget of 500,000. We do not have the setting capacity of 75. Mm -hmm. And my clause was, when I submitted the application to the liquor board, I had, some, I had filled up all the plans and everything, and they accepted my application. Second thing is, if we do not have, like, if you guys say that you need 500,000 or 75 setting, before us, it used to be Tandav. Before Tandav, it used to be Tarbas, the Greek restaurant. It had, a, like, 70 grand, like, 70,000 uh, investment and uh, only a 32 setting, and it still had the liquor license, which was sold. Yeah, this, license, this location so like had a liquor license before under different, uh, for different restaurants. I don't know if it's the same license. Do you yeah, know, Mr. Page? But the, but the law has changed over the years in the 46th legislative district. So it's just district, about a one year ago. Yes, one, one year ago. Requiring certain seating capacity and certain capital investment. I don't have the information about the prior license in front of me. Right. Yeah. This is a new license. There was a license at this, this location. This is a new class a B. Party. A different party had a license. Well, what he's saying is the license might have been different, and the law has changed since then. So okay. and this these are the new license also. And this is a new license. Excuse me, ma'am, but I haven't seen the law changed within the time period, like it got switched over. It got changed a years ago, but not this year. Like, we just took a business, it's been, we just finished one year. And the last year, it, the liquor, we signed up the agreement in 2018, June. That time, the liquor license was still there. Since it was not running, not like the owner wasn't using it, so he sold the liquor license. To someone else. So I think what you're right do. now. My request for the liquor board was one clause, the five hundred thousand and setting capacity. We do not have that much. I understand what you're saying. So I think what you need to do is work with our staff to find out what you would qualify for in terms of a new license, uh, if you want to get a license. And apparently, this one you're not going to qualify for, but uh, there may be something that you can. Okay, sir. And I do have a little thing I have written. If you would like to have a note on it. I'm sorry. What? Sir, I do have some more points to be noted. Okay, but I, I received the letter. I think so. we should wait till. Yeah, why don't you, and then we'll bring it back if there's an, a license that you qualify for and we can consider it at that time. Okay? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Happy to be here on your side. So that's going to be continued. To be continued. <coughs> Charm City Mead Works, 407 East Preston Street, Suite B, Class D, Beer Brewery License, an application for a new Class D <coughs> Beer Brewery License under Article 2-207, small f, number one, dash number two, and Alcoholic Beverage Article 1-101, small c, number two, T, authorizing the board to grant an on-site consumption permit to an applicant that holds a class five brewery license requesting outdoor table service. Please come forward. Would you raise your right hand, sir, please? I do. Are you James 
Boycourt? That's, how that's do I correct. How do yes. I pronounce it? Boycourt. Okay. Um, good morning. So this is a unique one for us. So uh, you want to tell us about what's going on here? Yes. Uh, just for the record, I've opted to represent myself, even though I have a lawyer listed on the application. I conferred with him yesterday um, and felt very comfortable doing this myself. Um, we have operated in this location uh, we, for the last uh, two and a half years. We've been in business for five um, up until uh, uh, now, we've been um, regulated as a winery. What we produce is mead, which is a honey-based alcoholic beverage. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, under winery law, we are um, allowed to, to or we're, we have our own um, uh, ability to serve our own product. Uh, but as we have uh, changed the way that mead was regulated at the state level, um, we're switching over to brewery uh, licensing and uh, looking to get a local liquor license to essentially continue the business that we had existing in the same location. The legislature passed Senate Bill 596 to change the definition of mead to permit that? Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Um, other than that changeover, any, anything else in your business changing? Absolutely not. Um, I, um, I also have, uh, over the last uh, several years, um, just for the record, um, obtained several letters from the local community association, of which I'm a very active uh, member. Um, and which community I, association is that? Uh, Rebuild Johnson Square. Um, we, um, I have the most recent of which was, which was in support of our. Uh, uh, legislation uh, change, uh, but it also mentions sort of who we are in the community over there. Um, I was fixing the community association president's uh, lawnmower uh, last week. Um, it w uh, the reason I've opted to go a little bit lighter on uh, bugging them for uh, new letters of support and that kind of thing is just because I feel like uh, we're an existing business and um, have very good standing in the community, um, and I didn't want to bother him for a new letter. You messed up his lawnmower, right? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I'm really good with carburetors. <laughs> okay. um, Do you have the old letters, you said? Yeah, so I, I have the, like I said, the most recent of which was the um, letter to in Thanks. support of our legislative change. Um, I also, uh, we, we got our uh, certificate of occupancy reflecting um, the outdoor seating. Um, and that was a little bit, uh, a little bit close to the deadline here. So I didn't know if that was in the file for you guys. Uh, so I brought a couple copies of it. It may be, but let's see. Let me ask a question if I could, Mr. Chairman. So explain to me, um, I, I understand a brewery and I understand that there are tasting areas is that a similar business model to, to what your this changeover? Explain to me what it, if I walk in, is there any different characteristic between what you offer versus a brewery? No, and uh, functionally, you know, most wineries would have a tasting room as well, but it was included under the uh, state winery legislation that you can serve your own product. We actually applied for a liquor license when we first went into this location which some municipalities and counties have opted to um, give under winery legislation, even though it's not um, explicitly required by the state. Um, and we were turned down because uh, we were not guaranteed a license uh, by letter of the law. Um, we, th we thought the city would like to regulate us and, and have that be something, but um, the change in brewery to brewery licensing solved a few problems for us. We, we typically operate more with a brewery model. Meads have been a sort of a redheaded stepchild um, in the alcoholic beverage industry. Is there a lot of um, demand for mead? Uh, we do uh, quite a lot of mead. We, we're the, uh, by winery legislation, we were the third largest winery in Maryland uh, last year. 
um, and I think the third largest meadery in the country, um, which is pretty good for a five-year business. By beer barrels, uh, we would do, uh, last year, I did about 1,600 barrels, and by um, wine uh, gallons, it was uh, right around 50,000 gallons. Interesting. So we've just been a, a redheaded stepchild and being regulated as a brewery helps our distribution. It gives us um, potentially uh, the ability to have a liquor license, which would allow us to um, serve like collaboration beers. So if we do a, a brew that's half mead and half beer with a local brewery, now we can actually you know, show our customers that. A lot of people come in asking for things like that that we, you know, make with other people and we can't under, uh, or we, you know, we couldn't under a winery uh, licensing do that. So it was, a, it was a major shift for us to push in this direction. How many people at your operation handle the alcohol? I mean, to customers? Um, we have, uh, 11 full-time employees and then 25 to 30, um, you know, part-time uh, contractors who might come in for a shift or two a week. Do they, are they certified alcohol? They are, and we do annual training. Uh, we get the uh, restaurant association to come in and do the training on our big uh, projector screen. So what happens if we approve this? What happens to your winery, li winery license? Is that We're actually sort of keeping it uh, just in case we want to make some wine. It's not going to go away. We're just going to hold both in conjunction. It's already been worked out with and the state. And it, it's sort of a natural then extension that you would keep your wholesale license as well, right? Yes. Okay, so that, so that remains in place from the state. Everything remains in place. We now have uh, both beer and wine wholesale um, you know, manufacturer and wholesaler licenses. So we have our M4, our M5, our W6, and our W7. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? Um. Do you have anything else you want to add? Um, not really. I, I, I'm here to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, but we're an existing business doing pretty well, and uh, we employ locally, and our I think in fairly good standing in the community. We've never had any complaints. Okay, commissioners? Nothing for no me. Further questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Boycourt. So on the basis then of the materials contained in the application, which includes the new legislation to support this, uh, the exhibits that have been received and your testimony, I would vote to approve the new Class D beer brewery license requesting outdoor table service. I concur and vote to approve the new Class D brewery license with outdoor table service. I, too, vote to approve the new Class D beer brewery license with outdoor table service. Thank you. Good luck. Um, just one small thing. Uh, the, the one thing I'm not familiar with is once this vote takes place, uh, what's my next step? You're going to have to talk with the folks down there about getting the license. <laughs> there are always steps, aren't there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mr. Page or Ms. Russell will fill you in. Fair enough. Thank you. Was there only one exhibit? Well, he gave us two. Uh, one we already had, but we, he did give us two. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I just brought a couple of copies. Thank you. I posted it for the record. F exhibit one, letter of support um, from Rebuild Johnson Square Neighborhood Association. Ministry of Brewing, LLC, trading as Ministry of Brewing, 1900-20 East Lombard Street. This is a Class D <coughs> beer license, an application for a new Class D beer brewing license under Article 2-207, small e, small i. The board to grant an off-site consumption permit to an applicant that holds a Class 5 Brewery license requesting delivery of alcoholic beverages. Come forward. Thank you. 
Good morning. For the record, Justin Williams from the law firm Rosenberg Martin Greenberg on behalf of the Applicants Ministry of Brewing LLC. Good morning. Would the gentleman raise your right hands, please? Did I hear Mr. Pace that this is not an application for a Class D brewery license? What, what is the application for? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> this is an application for a new Class D. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's all right. Thank you, yep. Mr. Williams. If I may proceed by way of proffer. Um, I'm joined by the applicants, um, Ernst Valerie. Uh, Dr. David Wendell and Michael Powell, also Cornell graduates, like the last, <laughs> the first here. Big Cornell red. day today, big red day today, you know, <laughs> the liquor board. Um, like uh, Mr. Page just indicated, we're here for a Class D brewery license in conjunction with the um, Class Five manufacturing license the applicants already have. I've included um, um, and given you some packet of exhibits and things to go over. I'll just walk you through them quickly. Okay. A little background on the Ministry of Brewing. Um, it's a proposed brewery and brew pub facility located within a former church. Um, the applicants are here, and then their other business partner, Jeff Hunt, is the founder of a brewery, Mad Tree Brewing, and Cure and Spirits. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about each of the other individual licensees. So um, what is, what's Greg Rapasarda's connection with this? <laughs> he worked on the zoning portion of the case. Okay, Greg Rap, the, the priest, or the lawyer? from yeah, so the lawyer. Okay, so I know them both well. I, oh, and there was a priest. The his name? father is uh, a priest, and he was in my class in high school, and the son was my neighbor. <laughs> That's Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the, the concept was uh, conceived by um, the Cornell graduates, uh, former roommates and friends from college, and they were thinking for a while about how to um, collaborate in the business plan, and this um, is what they came up with. Their proposal is to brew beer in the, in the church facility and um, kind of take, its, take advantage of the local eccentric culture of Northern Upper Fells um, and brew beer and provide food to the neighborhood. They also want to have a component of community engagement and education and sustainability. Um, there will be educational outreach led by Dr. Wendell to teach neighborhood kids how to brew beer and hopefully get them involved in the um, industry and get them their foot in the door for the first job. Yeah, it's, more of a, it's more of like a lab skills. Okay. So I've yeah. done some of this at the University of Cincinnati and it, I feel like lab skills are more marketable than just brewing. That's true. So it's yeah, gentlemen, if oh, you would identify um, yourselves, please. Uh, David Wendell. Um, so, so you were on the faculty at the University of Cincinnati? Correct. And in what field? Um, so I have the two appointments, one in biomedical engineering and one in environmental engineering. And that led you to brewing beer? It did. <laughs> it did. <laughs> I teach, uh, the courses I teach are... Your students got there faster than you did. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it's, the courses I teach are relatively popular. It's, it's changed over the years, but... It did lead me to, um, so I teach uh, what they call synthetic biology, but it's a lot of microbio, and part of the lab portion of my microbio, the students can do a lab of their own choosing, and a lot choose to do a fermentation project. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. Um, uh, the chairman has already saw the zoning um, board approval um, in 2018. They got zoning board approval to use the facility as a it's the zoning category is a food production, but also includes the brewing of beer. So there's no religious component other than the fact that you're in an old church. Correct. I was getting to that. There's an <laughs> article in the, um, B from the BBJ showing also that Ministry of Brewing um, received a state loan from the State Board of Public Works for uh, $750,000. Um, I'll talk to you about the church oh, portion. Establishment clause problems with that. Well, we're, we're, <laughs> we're getting there. So uh, the Google Earth aerial shows the premises. It's the church at the corner of Wolf and Lombard, the former St. Michael's Church, Roman Catholic Church from Upper Fells. That has a really interesting history that I dug into. I included an excerpt from the National Historic Register about the premises. Um, it opened in 1852 and catered to immigrants from the Polish and German communities. Um, but it has been vacant since 2011. In the archdiocese, uh, as a grandson of a Protestant minister, I, didn't, I had to learn this. There, the Catholic Church has a procedure about relegating things to profane use. It does. Oh, Mr. Chair can probably enlighten me more. Um, but that uh, That's what you've done with the interior? Nice. So the, the can, the under canon law, the church deconsecrated the premises, and so it is not a sacrilege to use the premises as a brewery. Um, <clears throat> as you see in the, um, the rendering provided for you, the plan is to use former wood for the church 
from the church to build tables and chairs for the uh, patrons to use in the tap room. Yeah, we've actually finished the tables. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry? We, fi we finished the tables. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we were able to reclaim wood um, from parts of the church from the original build and make new tables out of them. And the plan is to operate as a traditional tavern. There won't be servers, the patrons will go to the bar area and each of the bar staff would be uh, tips trained and certified and then there might be buzzers running around us to pick up dishes. Um, How many serve mead? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. How many employees will, will uh, They project uh, once they're up and running fully 25 new jobs between the brewery and tap room component. Um, under state law, they're only authorized to operate the tap room from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., so that will be their hours of operation once they're running. Their policy and checking IDs will be anyone that looks under 35 years old will be asked to show their ID. Um, I have included in the outline um, just a little brief background on each of the individual applicants. They're very impressive people with credentials and resumes, a, a professor at a college. Uh, uh, Mr. Valerie is a local developer and very active on many boards. Uh, Mr. Powell was the former COO. Vice President. Vice President. Sorry, I did not agree. Vice President of Panera Bread uh, Manufacturing for 20 years. Um, they're all familiar with the rules of the liquor board and a uh, uh, pledge to abide by them. We, the, you have a memorandum of understanding with the Washington Hill Community Association? So I've included the, yes, letters of support from the community, four diff uh, three different ones, so Oberfell's, Washington Hill, and Butcher's Hill. Is the MOU going to be uh, a restriction on the license? Was there MOU? I don't think. But I have a is that written in there? In a letter. It's in the letter. Um, pursuant to a, a memorandum of understanding with the neighboring community associations, where Mr. Valerie is a signatory. Also, new one. Oh, it just came in. Rep of 10. Yeah, to be fine with this. Yeah, so we get, we're, we're okay with all these conditions being a condition on the license? Yes. Okay. Do you have anything further, Mr. Williams? Mr. Chairman, are we able to have a copy of the MOU for the fall at some point? Yeah, would you submit one, please, afterwards? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Valerie, any issues? I know you're licensing at the Chesapeake. Any issues, any violations? Uh, we were previously licensed at the Chesapeake, and that has been transferred over to uh, folks in the Karzai family. Okay, and Prince any, Valerie. Right, and any, you didn't have any issues, any violations? Never. And um, is there an investment threshold that needs to be met here or seating capacity? The only issue, the threshold requirement is to have a class five license and they have already obtained it as an example or the uh, right. copy of it's in the file. Thank you. Anything else? All right, thank you. Um, on the basis then of the materials contained in the application, proffers from council, all the exhibits which will be received and the testimony received, um, I would vote to approve the application for a new class D beer brewery license requesting delivery of alcoholic beverages subject to the terms of the memorandum of understanding to the extent that they are enforceable by law. I concur and vote to approve the new class D uh, beer brewery license with uh, delivery of alcoholic beverages and um, um, the condition of the MOU to the extent it's enforceable by law. Uh, I join my colleagues and uh, approve the new Class D beer brewery license with the delivery of alcoholic beverages um, subject to the terms of the MOU to the extent they're uh, enforceable by law. Good luck, gentlemen. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I call exhibits for the record. App Exhibit 1, Business Plan, Board Exhibit 1, Letter of Support from Washington Hill, Community Association, dated 7-3-2019. Four no, one seven, North Utah Street, Class B, Beer One and Liquor License, an application to transfer ownership with continuation of outdoor table service. Please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Harry Previs on behalf of the applicant, Ricky Johnson. Right, right Mr. Johnson, you raise your right hand, please. You swear or affirm the testimony you served at the beginning of the hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Mr. Previs. Yeah, so this is a transfer um, of the bead, beer, wine, and liquor license. Um, we're removing um, Brian Noto and Amina Dukic off the license and adding Ricky onto the license, Mr. Johnson. Um, will he be the sole licensee then? He will be the sole licensee. Um, Mr. Johnson's been 
the manager at Forno, the general manager, for five years since they opened. And um, he was presented with the opportunity to purchase the business, and he was excited about that. And um, he'll uh, go <laughs> forward. And you haven't had any problems um, on this license in the past? I don't think there's Never. any violations. OK. Um, and you've been in the business for five years. Um, any other background in this? Me? Yep. Yeah. Um, sorry. B beforehand, oh. you were working as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I've been managing bars and restaurants in the city since 2009. So a lot of experience. That's how I knew uh, Brian Noto and his wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they were opening Forno, they reached out to me to sort of take over um, the front of house operations. How many people do you manage? Uh, right now we have 26 staff members. How many of them handle alcohol? Um, all the front of house, so I would say 10. And are they uh, TIP certified? A couple of them are. The bartenders are. Um, but I do plan to have uh, the whole staff just in one day kind of certified so that um, I think it's, it's good knowledge. Yes, yeah. especially be careful with them with sales to minors and yeah, all the absolutely. other issues that we ha face here. Um, okay, commissioners have questions. Yeah, it, it sounds like it sounds like the operations are going to continue as is. So yep. any changes, no changes to anything. Okay. No, just some small aesthetic mm -hmm. sprucing up, but the concept, the the staff, the menu, everything is going to stay exactly the same. And we have copies of the menus if you'd like to take a look at it. It's kind of an upscale um, Italian restaurant. Okay. Um, did you have any questions? No questions. All right. I'm not going to base this on the menu, but I am interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. On the basis of the materials contained in the application, the proffers from council, the testimony received, and the exhibits which will be received, I vote to approve the transfer of the um, beer, wine, and liquor license to Mr. Johnson. I concur and vote to approve the transfer of the beer, wine, and liquor license with continuation of outdoor table service. And I, too, vote to uh, approve the transfer with the continuation of outdoor table service. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks. My cause is for the record. I have exhibit one, menu. Good. Mm -hmm. Take a copy of the menu. Sure. Thank you. He still needs to review it, though. <laughs> have you reviewed it? Blue Agave 1032 White Street, Class B, Beer, Wine, and Liquor License, an application to transfer ownership with continuation of outdoor table service. Please come forward. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, please, this is Frank Solis representing the applicant. Good morning. Sir, would you raise your right hand, please? Sir. Would you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing is true, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Mr. Solis? This is a class uh, transfer of a Class B restaurant license from Brian Aquavella to Andrew Wazemski. I transferred this license about seven years ago to Mr. Aquavella, and since that time, it has remained the same. There's been no violations. Uh, the entire staff, except for maybe a couple new hires, is alcohol certified. Uh, there's no change in the operation, and Mr. Lezinski has uh, 10 years of experience. He managed a uh, bar called the Monkey, uh, <laughs> Monkey something in Salisbury. Monkey Barrel. Monkey Barrel. I, I wanted to say something else. <laughs> and uh, he's Have been you ever worked at Blue Agave? Worked there for yes. the past seven years. Okay. He's been since the manager off and on. Since they've, I, I started as a bartender, and since they've opened, I've worked there and taking on increasing responsibilities, but now I'm a manager currently, um, and then taking the next step to purchase from Brian. And it looks like you're a licensee at another establishment? Correct. I'm sure you know it very well. I was licensee at 3500 O'Donnell. What's the name of the establishment? Lears was the establishment prior. Now it's the Shipyard Pub. That license has been transferred. Yeah. Any issues with that, any violations with that establishment? Uh, with, with either, no. No, not since I've been at Blue Agave and nothing with uh, the Lears 3500 O'Donnell Street license. Sorry. Okay. 
Do you have any questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Charles, on the basis then of the materials contained in the application, the proffers from Council and the testimony received, I would vote to approve the transfer of the beer, wine, and liquor license to Mr. Lozinski. I concur and vote to approve the transfer of ownership with continuation of outdoor table service. I, uh, too, uh, approve the transfer with the continuation of outdoor table service. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. I take no offense to the redheaded comment before, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Page, is that the morning docket? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. The board is in recess until 1 p.m. Okay. See you then. Was it? Sky Guerrero hit 87 home runs. And then Mr. Maslin is still waiting on number seven. Right? Got worn out. He said he'd be this week. He's <laughs> retired, huh? Hello, Mr. Maslin. How are you, sir? Good to see you as well. It's been a while. All right, Mr. Page, we ready to go? I uh, think we are, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. The Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City proceedings will begin. The board is now in session. If you're in possession of any type of electronic device, please place that device on the off or silent mode during proceedings. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, there being no preliminary matters on the PM docket. Case number one, the One Sports Bar and Lounge, 4314-16 Curtis Avenue. This is a Class B, beer, wine, and liquor license. Here for violation of Rule 3.08, small b, sanitation and safety on March the 8th, 2019. Violation of Rule 4.16, illegal conduct on March the 8th, 2019. Please come forward. All those who are going to testify, please come forward, raise your right hands. That's correct. Yes. Are you Mr. Stansbury, sir? Yes. Uh, got charged with two violations on March 8th. Do you wish to admit or deny them? Uh, yeah. I'm to do. I'm sorry. Admit or deny them? Admit. Okay. So you want to tell us what happened? Um, well, I was well at the time. I wasn't there. Um, Fire Marshal and BGE came to the facility. Um, said that uh, we was running illegal electricity. Um, I, I, had no, I had no knowledge of that. I, I, I took over the building, didn't know, didn't know it was uh, two boxes at my building at the time. I did what I had to do as far as getting everything up and running. Um, I took care of the bill the following day, and here it is right here. And come to find out that when BGE came in, they saw the old uh, electricity box because being though I wasn't there, the main box is in the basement, so no one could get in the basement because I had the keys. So they turned the BGE off, BGE off. So I went the next day to take care of the bill, and as when I when I paid the bill, BGE also gave me a credit because they saw that it was two boxes running in the facility that I had no knowledge of. Okay, is there? A representative from the gas electric company and I have the bill right here stating that they gave me a credit because okay. I was paying I guess too much so uh, d are you aware of this sir that's correct can I you can. identify come forward and identify yourself please sure. Lieutenant Dawson Baltimore City Fire Marshal's office at the night uh, we went to the location violence reduction initiative with vice narcotics liquor board and all that point in time during the inspection which they were subject to fire evaluations we went there we found the main electrical panel missing the main meter box that goes in there. That is automatically a violation of the fire codes and the electrical codes. When we asked a representative on location if he was aware of any other boxes or anything else, he wasn't sure. We did make entry into the basement. It was open and we made it down there. We did document information on there. I cannot produce photos due to the current system down. We've only been able to recover so much. bg &E was requested because 
the system downstairs, when shut down, was still allowing power upstairs, which meant it was coming through that main box. Requested BG and Electrical to respond. BG and Electrical responded in their main meter box against the very rear wall. There was a double loop or a phase in there that when bg &E put a new box in, they did not disconnect. So initially it was thought that they were bypassing and getting electric because there was an extension cord running from the outside through the structure and down. Mm -hmm. When I thought it with bg and &E, bg and &E admitted that there was an issue on their part. Instead of cutting two feeds, they only cut one. So even if we shut off the main breakers during an emergency, this building was still going to be energized. So the problem was caused by bg &E. caused by bg and &E. It was missed by bg and &E. There was no malice. There was no theft or anything else. However, the fire department did issue numerous violations at that time for emergency lighting, exit signs, use of extension cords, and several other issues. And all that's to, to date, there has not been a callback for reinspection, and there is not an active fire permit. I do have here in their system, their permit expired April 20th, 2019, has not been renewed. I have not spoken with Mr. Stansberry. There's been another gentleman who's come to my office on at least one occasion because one of the requirements for the fire code violations was to have an affidavit from a master electrician certifying the electrical was compliant to code. Okay. Um, He's Mr. got that now. Let me just get a clarification. Mr. Page, I don't see that they were violated for anything other than the wiring. Um, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. So I guess uh, if they have issues that continue with the fire department, you're going to have to continue with them. Yep, uh, we will follow with them yeah. on there. But as of right now, they have no active permits. So they're not allowed to operate for business until they turn around and have an inspection by the fire marshal's office. So you understand that you may be okay with us, but you're not okay with them yet. You've got to work something okay. out. Okay. But let's find out how the commissioners uh, want to do. Do you have any uh, anything further? Uh, oh, no, nothing. Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Dawson, quick question. As part of your process, has there, or uh, I guess to anyone in the city, was Mr. Stansbury fined or charged or shut down? There was a cease and desist order to close the establishment. So there was a cease and desist order for unsafe conditions because the electrical, we couldn't confirm or deny. I'm not a master electrician. I have to wait for the public utility. They came there. They weren't even sure about it. So in the heat of safety and under fire code, we closed them. Okay. The cease and desist order was issued. They had to go and meet all the violation notices on our forms, get the master electrician, get the form, which I have a copy of now he's given here. Uh, so we'll follow up and go from there. As far as citations, citations were issued through the Environmental Control Board, which I believe there was a hearing scheduled either next week, but okay, I know so it's coming. Have, so you have not gone through the Environmental Control Board yet? No. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? Okay. Um, thank you. On the basis then of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, I would um, dismiss the violation of Rule 3.08 small b on March 8th and dismiss the violation of Rule 4.16 on March 8th. I, I agree with the dismissal as to each violation. Yeah, given given uh, the error on bg es part, I would concur with dismissing violation of Rule 3.08B and violation of Rule 4.16. Okay. Thank you, sir. And we'll waive it. Okay. Thank you, sir. You have to follow up with the fire department, but okay. you're okay with us, all right? Thank you. Charm City Lounge, 407 East Saratoga Street, Class BD7, Beer Wine and Liquor License, violation of Rule 3.08, small b, Sanitation and Safety on February the 8th, 2019, violation of Rule 4.08A, Relationships with Wholesalers on February the 8th, 2019, Violation of Rule 4.17, storage on February the 8th, 2019. Please come forward. Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, Gary Maslin on behalf of the uh, licensees. Good afternoon. All those who are going to testify, please raise your right hand. We will affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing. will be truthful. Mr. Maslin, admissions or denials? It would be in the denials. Okay. Um, who's going to testify? I'll start off. Please come over to the mic, Detective. On uh, 8 February of this year at uh, 8.30 p.m., 
Myself, along with members of Vice, agents from the, uh, the Baltimore City Liquor Control Board, inspectors from the Fire Marshal Office, inspectors from the Health Department, and investigators from Housing, all of which make up the Social Club Task Force, conducted an inspection at Charm City Life Club, located at 407 East Saratoga Street. Uh, once at the location, the task force met with BG and investigator Chester Reese, along yeah, with other. I want to object. He seems to be reading from a report rather than testifying, from his recollection. So well, he uh, that he's in, he's entitled to do it if he'd like it. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to cross-examine. Right, okay, go ahead, detective. All right. So we met with uh, investigator Chester Reese, along with other security specialists, um, as well as other security specialists and technicians from their company. Investigator Reese advised members of the Check, task force. Yeah, I'm going to object at this point. He's talking now. Somebody else testified to that's not present in court here to uh, be cross examined. So I'd, I'd ask that that matter be, be stricken. I'm going to overrule, but go ahead. Okay, so we agreed that Chester Reese and his technicians are on the scene. All right. You can go ahead. You can All read right. it. I just got to find my place without being uh, interrupted, but okay. thank you. The establishment is only open for Pesky staff and preparation to open uh, for evening along with the manager. Um, the manager there, Mr. Nagash, whom was in operation, control of the premises at the time, Investigator Reese, also advised that it had come to the attention of BG&E officials that um, the meters inside the establishment, that was tampering inside the, uh, with the meters inside the, uh, the establishment. All right, all right. During the investigation, bg &E, uh, technicians found and removed several meters from the location known as Trump City Life Club. Um, to further investigate, the meters had been indeed tampered. Uh, inspectors from fire marshals found major fire code violations involving the building sprinkler system, as well as other critical co uh, fire code violations. Uh, during the inspection, uh, Agent Chris Malice, a case uh, including a case including Hennessy and other various alcohol products and sat in an adjacent uh, storage room that came from another liquor establishment was found on a location. It was later revealed the manager, Mr. Uh, Nagash, possibly manages and or is an owner of another liquor establishment and he was bringing alcohol from that establishment um, to the uh, location of Charm City Life Club for the sale and consumption of the uh, said alcohol. Housing investigators found minor violations relating to housing code, health inspectors, found both male and female bathrooms dirty and evidence of smoking, which not only is a fire code violation, but a health code violation. Uh, bg &E technicians shut the power off of the establishment and removed several meters from the club as mentioned. Uh, let's see, fire marshals uh, office issued a cease and desist on the premises of Charm City Life Club. And at that time, the investigation was concluded. Mr. Maslin, you have questions? Yeah. Now, when you went to the Charm City nightclub, the business was closed, was it not? It was open. Were any customers in there? I can't recall. Right. Was there a cleanup crew there? Can't recall. Uh, what time did you go in? According to my report, I went in at uh, the whole task force, went in at uh, 8.30 p.m. Do you have anybody here today from the um, BG&E? No. Uh, you're not an expert in BG&E, are you? That's correct. Uh, you're not an expert in the, fire, the health department, is that correct? That's correct. And was there not a cleanup crew there at that time? Uh, that time, I can't recall. Y you don't recall? No. All right. Do you recall seeing this gentleman there? Uh, it's a possibility. Like they said, this was back in, uh, what was that? February. February of this year, so. All right. Didn't people, after you entered the premises, didn't other people arrive later? I can't recall that, sir. You don't recall that? Um, do you recall speaking with this gentleman here? Yes, it's a yes, because I, really? I do for me, I'm familiar, I made checks to the location, so I'm very familiar with him. All right, so y you're aware that he is the manager of the, 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 the facility? Yes, because he's the person I deal with. If I'm not there, if I'm not there on official business, I, duck, I do he, he, conduct he's the, he's, he's nightly the checks, so Matter I, fact, I deal with him. He's registered with the board as the manager, is that correct? You don't, you don't know that? Well, I don't know if he's registered with the board, but as far as the manager of the place, the only person I, I mainly deal with is this gentleman here. Okay. Do you know his name? Not offhand. Okay. I'm responsible for all liquor establishments in the city of Baltimore. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't have further questions. Okay. Do we have other testimony? 
Lieutenant, can you testify as to the electrical issues? So as far as the electrical issues goes, BG&E was independent at that night task force, involved Baltimore City Police, Vice Narcotics, and the entire teams. Within Baltimore City, IFC Chapter 1 is adopted. The Fire Marshal's Office has the right to inspect any location that is open or is occupied during reasonable times. Since it's established as a nightclub that operates at any hours, could operate during the day, evenings. Upon arrival, there were persons there. Per protocol, we identified ourselves as fire marshals coming to inspect a location. Upon entering location, we noted several violations throughout there. BG was reporting there being issues with electrical. I have copies of photos here if you wish to admit them into there. We the primary gentleman that identified as being a representative for me is this gentleman here sitting in the row. I, don't, I, I can't see him. <laughs> okay. You want him to swear him in and advise his name for you? Uh, yes. Come forward, sir. Raise your right hand, please. Come forward. Swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Come up to the mic, please, and tell us your name. Jonas Nagars. Okay. And what did you want to? Okay. So, Mr. Can you Jack spell his name, please? Spell your name. Y O N A S. Last name N E G A S H. Jonas? Yes. All right, Lieutenant. So this gentleman died himself as representative of the manager on duty, and we continued. I walked him pretty much through the entire premises. This is a short briefing of notations as I reported before. The fire record system is down. They're still in the process of recovering. And they had numerous violations. Within the photos, you'll note that there was a fire extinguisher tag attached to the fire alarm panel, saying that the fire alarm panel was an extinguisher, which told me the system was not tagged as per code. I don't know if it's operating. Within the photos, you'll see yellow lights that tell you the system was in trouble. I then went over to what's called the sprinkler system or the incoming water. There was no service tags on there. I then reported it to the gentleman that in addition with bg &E removing the power, they could not operate because by code, the system, fire alarm has to be on primary power. You can't be on emergency lighting. Egress has to be 100% compatible. That was explained to him. Went through there. This is going to be a pretty lengthy list. If you just want to admit it in, I'll give you a copy of it or I can read it as I go. Submitted. So was um, you issued a cease and desist order? Issued a cease and desist order on that day. Follow-up visit was done on 315 with their council present at that time. Went through and gave them a pretty lengthy. Uh, they have cooperated. They've actually done, um, how should I say, it? been very cooperative getting in. There were several hiccups where there were apparently uh, people, in my opinion, trying to intimidate within code enforcement. Uh, one subject came there wearing a Baltimore City Hall pin which we came up with the person's name, was given to my commander and brought to the VRI meeting and that was addressed there. Um, I don't know why people would call and want to get their public representatives in when they clearly have code violations issued to them. Uh, the other issues we had and actually found out courtesy of him is through no fault of his own, he was given false reports by sprinkler companies. So he's been kind through the ringer. He's paid thousands of dollars to go out and generally I don't testify on behalf but they issued a report, said there was no problems with it. We noted that there was a ton of difficulties. The time they've been down since February till July 1st when a new permit was issued. Yes. So during that time, they've been closed and couldn't affect. They went as far as I'm concerned above and beyond to be compliant with it. Uh, they've learned that they can't really trust too many. And as of this point, they still have some open violations, but they're minor not to keep them closed. And besides the closing, were they fined? Um, no, given the fact that we were closing them and when we found out that some things were given to them incorrectly, that they were kind of you know, paid somebody money and these tags were put on there, I felt that it was enough that they lost several thousands on that. Okay, you have questions, Mr. Maslin? Yeah. This, this license was transferred to, at this location um, a couple years ago, is that correct? 2018. 2018. At that time, the fire department went out to this premises, inspected the, the, the facility. These violations obviously existed at that time. So I can't acknowledge that unless you give me photographic proof that it, it's only an assumption. But but in, in your list, there's, there's, there's things involving the sprinkler heads and, and things like that weren't, weren't compliant. That's correct. And in accordance to NFPA 13, the code clearly says that it is up to the responsibility of the owner to have their testing done every year by a certified professional and to abate any deficiencies noted when requested for all historical reports by code none were ever produced all right so the, the point i make it was inspected in, uh, about a year ago by the fire department and they absolutely notated no violations is that a fair statement that i can't answer to because the inspector that this gentleman called that night was apparently a friend or relative as reported by this gentleman 
So I can't answer to what that inspector does. What I'm not going to testify on behalf of somebody who wasn't there. I understand. I can though. attest to my training and my professional credentials. That says when I went in there, this is what I noted, and this was in violation. Well, were IFC says the owner is responsible to make sure that he's up to all code updates. The IFC says he has to maintain his fire alarm system. He has to keep his reports on site. They right, were not just, there. Just were were the you involved in the inspection when the license was transferred in 2008? No, I was not. Someone else from your office was? The inspector was, that's correct. All right, and he was a licensed fire inspector representative of, the, of your office, correct? He's not a licensed fire inspector. He's a certified fire inspector assigned to the Office of the Fire Marshal. Right. And they approved the premises, correct? The member did, that's correct. All right. And, and it was only when you brought all this to their attention was everything, and they promptly, they shut down, they corrected it. As a matter of fact, they, they replaced every sprinkler head in the entire premises. Isn't that correct? I can't affirm that. I was not the last one to be there on July 1st, and the reports were given to the commander yes, who was there yes, on July the 1st. Commander was there. But, but, isn't it, it, but you requested them to replace a significant amount of sprinkler heads. Actually, what I told them to do was make sure that their sprinkler heads were compliant for what was required, right. meaning okay. that they have to have the appropriate temperature sprinkler heads in there. If it was discovered by their evaluation that the sprinkler heads weren't the right temperatures, and any standard inspector, any standard inspector is not going to pick up on that. Right. Understand that. They rely on the tag that is put on the equipment. Right. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, no, Your Honor. Okay. Um, and do you have any questions with respect to the other violations? Well, he's not capable of testifying. No, the, the detective is. Pardon me? The detective testified about the other violations. Well, we'd object to any reference to any uh, BG&E. They're not, they're not here I'm not, to represent I'm talking them. about the, uh, the stories of the uh, alcohol from the other facility. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, the, the detective, the alcohol that you referred to, uh, wasn't that in a separate area inside the premises, separate um, storage closet? Uh, Agent Chris Malice. Well, yeah, Chris Malice, former city liquor board. Um, it was in a liquor closet with other liquor. It was separated. Is that correct? No, it was in a closet with other in liquor. A closet. Uh, but it was in a separate area, separate closet. It was in a closet uh -huh. with other liquor. One closet, a bunch of liquor. All right. And um, do you know him to be the manager of the establishment? I do. Yeah. Okay. I don't have further questions. Sir. Okay, anything else? No, not at this point. Commissioners have questions? No questions. Okay. Um, you want to be heard on the violations? Well, could I put on some testimony? I thought I didn't. Okay, I asked if, any, if there was anything yeah, else. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> could, you, could you state your name for the record, please? Yeah. But my name is Malau Bulgeta. Uh, uh, this gentleman has to hear and spell it. M E L A K U, that's the first name. M E L A K U. Now, Mr. And his last name. Last name M U L U G E T A. And were you working at. Um, M -E L U G E T A. Were you working at Charm City Lounge on, on the night when the task force came in? Yes. And was the establishment open or closed? It was closed. I was using the back door to clean up the place. And it. Was it going to open that evening? No, I was prepared for the next day. You were preparing for the next day? Right. Where was the manager or Mr. Nagash or the licensee present at the premises at that time? Nobody was there by myself. Okay. And when they came in, what did you do? There was a lot, they asked me so many different questions, so I have to rush and call the manager uh, which is Justin, and I called uh, Hermes, and I called uh, Almas. And you called the licensee and you called the manager, is that correct? Right. And did the manager respond to the location? That's right. And did Mr. Nagash also respond to the location? That's right. And the, the alcohol that was found there in, in question, was that alcohol that was used by the, by the club? Who did that alcohol belong to? Belong to Justin, the manager. Okay. All right. Thank you. I've got further questions. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any questions? 
I don't. Do I don't stuff. have any questions. All right, so, so wait. So this establishment was closed on a Friday night at eight thirty, because February eighth was a Friday night. Yes. Okay. Sorry, your commissioner statement there, Hunt. Uh, Justin Hunt. And Mr. Hunt, you uh, are the manager of the Charm City Lounge. Yes, sir. Correct. And the establishment was closed on this particular day when the when the task force came in. Is that correct? Oh uh, yes, to respond to Mr. Greenfield, we're pretty much event based, so we're not like open like a regular ladies' night Friday. We're just when somebody books it, we open when we're closed. All right. And were you aware of any deficiencies whatsoever in in, in any of the the fire sprinkler systems or any of the um, electrical systems, anything related to the operation of this, this facility? Not to my knowledge, no, sir. You had never been cited with any violations? No, sir. All right. Now, there was alcohol found on the premises, a case of Hennessy um, alcohol. <coughs> Where was that stored? Inside a liquor room, we have a separate closet that locks within the actual liquor room. Uh, it's about a eight foot tall, three foot closet. It's about four feet deep, and it's a separate actual closet that we keep some things in. But that's pretty much where I kept my personal uh, liquor. And where did you get that alcohol? I got it from Mr. Nagash. Um, I actually have a nonprofit organization through Morgan State Football. What's uh, the name of your nonprofit organization? It's called the Morgan State Al Football Alumni Association. And do you buy alcohol for your nonprofit events? Yes, we do several functions a year. And you had kept it at this in this closet within the nightclub, is that correct? Yes, we have a shared space for the football association, but it just kept disappearing, so I wanted to remove it. All right, that alcohol was not in any way related <coughs> to the nightclub, is that correct? No, sir. That was alcohol you purchased for your own personal and I have use every receipt. in connection with your nonprofit organization, we, we is have that every, correct? Yes, sir, we have every receipt for it. All right. Now, with respect to the bathrooms, were you intending on cleaning up the bathrooms? We were open Thursday night. Uh, but we didn't end until about 2.30 in the morning. I mean, excuse me, you know, I left at 2.30 in the morning after we wrapped up everything, and I just was not in the mood to. I had to go to work the next day. I couldn't clean up that night. All right, so you're going to come back and clean up. That's why your, your cleanup man was in Told him to come in the next day, yes. All right, thank you. I don't have any further questions. Do you have any other evidence? Um, no, I just have the uh, licensee that, that's here. Do you have questions? No questions. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, with respect to the uh, bg and &E, there's, there's absolutely no testimony that's been presented before the board, so I'd ask that that charge be dismissed. Mm -hmm. With respect to the uh, alcohol that was there, the Hennessy, the uh, managers indicated that that was his for his nonprofit organization. He bought it there. Um, he, 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 sto he stored it there. Uh, with respect to the other violations, uh, they've all been corrected. The health department, the fire department, they came in. This place was inspected by the health, by the fire department on the 18th. It passed. They had no knowledge whatsoever of any existing violations. It wasn't like they were operating there with knowledge of violations. Clearly, uh, it, they were missed by. Is not the other inspector appears to be not as thorough as 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 this inspector. And that, that's unfortunate, but that shouldn't, the licensee should not be penalized because the prior health the fire department representative missed um, compliance with, with the code involving sprinkler heads that are up in the, in, in the, in the rafters. They're not, they're not experts. You've heard that they were extremely cooperative. You heard that they complied with everything they were asked for, and it cost them an extreme amount of money, not to mention the loss of business being closed for the amount of time it took to fix all of the, the sprinkler heads in, in the place. Everything has been repaired. Uh, the manager has explained everything else. Uh, I, I don't believe that the violations are sustained. Okay, thank you. Um, I would deny the motion to dismiss uh, on the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, I find a violation of Rule 3.08 small b on February 8, 2019. As far as any sanction, I would waive it because I believe that the closure for an extended period of time and their cooperation in repairing those issues uh, took care of that matter as far as I'm concerned. I find a violation of Rule 4.08 small a on February 8, 2019 and I'd impose a $250 fine. I find a violation of Rule 4.17 on February 8, 2019. I'd impose a $250 fine. 
I too find a violation of rule 3.08 small b on February 8th, 2019, and I concur with the waiver of a fine uh, given they were closed and uh, have corrected those issues. Um, I do uh, concur with finding a violation of rule 4.08 small a on February 8th, 2019, and I, and I concur with the two, imposition of $250 fine and finding a violation of rule 4.17 on February 8th, 2019, I concur with the imposition of $250 fine. Uh, I find a violation of rule 3.08B and would agree with waiving any sanction. I find a violation of rule 4.08A, would concur with the imposition of a $250 fine and would also find a violation of rule 4.17 and would concur with the imposition of a $250 fine. So they have 30 days to pay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Inspector. Good seeing you. Mike Elizabeth, for the record. Board Exhibit 1, former City Police Department um, report, Detective Elsie Greenhill. Board Exhibit 2, Fire Department violation list. Um, Board Exhibit 3, photos. <coughs> Bayview Liquors and Upper Level Lounge. 3804 Eastern Avenue, Class BD7, Beer, Wine, and Liquor License, violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors on April the 9th, 2019, <coughs> violation of Rule 3.03, Small C, Employee Records, April the 9th, 2019. Please come forward. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, Gary Maslin, on behalf of the licensee, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, All those who are present. going to testify, please raise your right hand. I do. I do. Uh, mission or denial? Uh, it is a denial. It's a little, okay. little bit Who's going to testify? Situation. All right. On 9 April of this year at 11.45 p.m., myself, along with uh, members of VICE, as well as Liquor Agent uh, Malice conducted on day sales and minor investigation at Bayview um, the upper level and uh, an upper level uh, meet located at 3804 Eastern Avenue. Also working with the Baltimore City Police Cadet uh, uh, Martinez, who was under the age of 21 at the time of the investigation. Cadet Martinez, <coughs> who was working in an undercover capacity at the Bayview Lookers and upper level located at 38, 3804 Eastern Avenue. Seated upstairs, sat at the bar next to the server who was working behind the bar for a corner beer. The server identified as Miss uh, Michaela P. Riveras with a date of birth of 6 1395. Sorry about that. Uh, served Cadet Martinez the corona beer, but did not request payment at that particular time which indicated Ms. Rivera's furnished the alcoholic beverage to Cadet Martinez. Cadet Martinez then notified vice detectives as well as legal agent Chris Amalis via text message that he had the alcoholic beverage in his possession. Minutes later, vice detectives as well as agent Chris Amalis entered the location at Bay called Bayview Liquors, upper level Lou, and advised Ms. Rivera that she had just furnished alcohol to an underage police cadet. Detective LeBron did not have to recover the Department of $20 bill during the course of the investigation, it was determined that Ms. Rivera was not supposed to be working behind the bar on this, this particular night. She was only supposed to be working as a hostess. Um, sure. uh, Vice Detectives as well as Agent Chris and Malice asked for the employee records to try to identify um, the bartender as well as um, Ms. Rivera's property for the instruction, but was unable to view them due to the records not being accessible at that time. Uh, agent Chris Amalis photographed the Corona beer. Myself, along with the agent Chris Amalis, explained to the manager working that um, Ms. Beham, that Ms. Rivera's would not be criminally charged um, for the furnished alcohol, but a ministry report will be written up for the establishment. If questions for the detective. Yes, uh, you, you weren't present there to observe any of this, were you? No, sir. Uh, the cadet was by himself, is that correct? That is correct. And you verified that the person that furnished the 
the Corona Beer never took any money from the cadet. Is that correct? That's correct. And you also verified that she was not a actual bartender. No. Is that correct? From what she told us or what the management told oh, us. So said she was not a bartender. She was to that night she was not supposed to be working behind the bar. All right. And the only two people upstairs in the lounge were in fact the cadet and this Miss Rivera's, is that correct? It's a possibility it might have been one other customer. This this particular bar doesn't seem to see too much uh, activity as far as customers. But you weren't up there to verify that? Is that uh, not until after we were called in. But you don't recall any other customers? I do recall one or two customers in another co in, a, in a corner of the bar. It wasn't like they were in there. Martinez was in there by himself with the bartender. Right. I think right. there were other, one or other two customers right. in there. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, do you want to put on testimony? Oh, uh, yeah. Good. Could you state your name, please? Jonas Nagash. Now, M Mr. Nagash, was uh, Ms. Rivera a, an employee of yours or a bartender? No, she's not. All right. Uh, but she furnished a alcoholic beverage to this um, cadet. Uh, are you aware of that? No, I do. Yes, you yes, were made aware of it. Yeah, yes, I do. And uh, can you tell the board how this happened to occur? The, the bartender on the schedule was Cynthia uh, Davis, which is, she's a friend of uh, Rivera's. So she came in to see her and to talk to her, you know, potentially working in the future. And during that time, uh, which Cynthia no longer work here in there no more because she went to smoke cigarette leaving uh, Rivera inside. So when, she, when the cadet come inside, I believe based on Rivera, that what she told me, uh, the cadet is from the same country where she's from, and they communicate very friendly and nice. So that's what motivated her to go inside and did that, which is she should never have done it, but she did it. All right, but, but she was, was she an employee? No. The bartender was outside smoking a cigarette? Outside smoking a cigarette. Was that, was that person authorized by you to serve anyone? No. No. She just did it on her own initiative? She did it on her own. And it was only uh, her and uh, the cadet. Right. And did she, she didn't take any money or payment from the, from the cadet? No, she did not. I, I, I thought she did, and she said she did not, and said she did not. Do you have any further evidence? Did you, did you terminate this? Uh, this employee? Yes. Right. And Ms. Rivera does not work for you and never no, has. No. All right. That's okay. all we have. You, uh, you want to be heard? Uh, just, just brief. This was not a, a situation. He does have TAM certified people working there. He is TAM certified. This is a, uh, uh, really it's an aberration. The bartender goes out to smoke a cigarette. Somebody comes upstairs. This friend of hers thinks she's doing a good deed and it's no good deed goes unpunished. And in this case, you know, so they, they apparently were from the same, I don't know what country they were, they were, they were from, uh, uh, but they had a, so, so she figures she's going to help out her friend, and of course the employer didn't have any knowledge of it, or found out about the whole thing, terminated the woman's uh, employment there. Um, so he's done everything that he, he could do to um, uh, ensure that incidents like this don't occur and he's advised that, that the, there's not to be anybody just leaving the, stout, the bar alone. He's made arrangements to make sure that there's coverage there at all times. If someone has to take a break for some personal, personal, uh, personal needs. Commissioners, have any questions? No questions. Uh, employee records, you oh, deny uh, them too? Can I, can I explain the employee record? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, the employee record, um, I don't leave it out because um, the record has all the information, including Social Security, that I don't want other employees to see the other. But now I do find a way to do it, which is I have the date of birth and the phone number and the address. And if Where do you keep the employee records? It's, it's locked in the lockbox. It's locked in a lockbox. Yeah. The, yeah. the, 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 the person on duty downstairs didn't have access to it? No, she don't. It was only you. The all, all day, uh, my sister had access to it. 
and then at night I come in, I have access to it. Did you remedy that now that someone has access to it? Yeah, now, now the, everybody have access to this because I took off the social security number. Anything further? Nothing further. Okay, thank you. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, I'd find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a on April 9, 2019, and I'd find a violation of Rule 3.03 small c on April 9, 2019. Uh, this record, this is um, a lot of date that goes back 10 years or more. This, this is the fourth sale to minor, and we've got an open and operating violation, two of these within the last two years, so it's not a good record. Uh, and this was a pretty irresponsible uh, way to manage a bar at that particular time. So I, uh, as to the first violation, impose a fine of $2,000, and as to the second, a fine of $1,000. I give them 30 days to pay. I, too, find a violation of Rule 4.01A, Sales to Minors, on April 9, 2019. And I concur with the imposition of a $2,000 fine as to that violation. And I, too, find a violation of Rule 3.03, small c, on April 9, 2019. I concur with the imposition of a $1,000 fine. I, um, although the record is pretty significant, um, I am not um, imposing a um, a suspension at this time. I find a violation of Rule 4.01A and agree with the imposition of a $2,000 fine. I find a violation of Rule 3.03C, employee records, and agree with the imposition of a $1,000 fine. And like my colleague, <coughs> Commissioner Hafey, I'm not inclined to impose a, a suspension, but the record is spotty and candidly, uh, your defense today was not convincing whatsoever. Um, so I'm would not like to see you come back on a violation. I hope you can work with our agency uh, to right these issues. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Sure. I close it just for the record. What is it? One, former city police department report. Uh, Detective Elsie Greenhill. Sooners Tavern, 1600 Hazel Street. Class BD7, beer, wine, and liquor license. Violation of Rule 4.01, small a, sales to minors on April the 9th, 2019. Please come forward. Council. Thank you. Good afternoon. Stephen W. Fogelman on behalf of the licensee. Good afternoon. All those who are going to testify, please raise your right hands. It's an admission. I do. Okay, Mr. Fogelman. Yes, thank you. As I say, this is an admission. Um, in this case, we have a, uh, I had her name and now, yeah, you don't have the right, correct glasses on right now. Ms. Chantel Lene Jones had worked for the establishment for two years. Um, she made an error of judgment. She was fired for that error of judgment. Um, Mr. Popa, who's the owner, the licensee, he is uh, in very, very poor health at this time. He's been in a uh, hospital. A transfer application has been filed for, to a new arm's length purchaser um, of this bar uh, so that it uh, can get proper management, so it can get full time, day to day, hands on management. Um, and that case is next month. In fact, uh, there would have already been a transfer hearing, but because of this violation, the board postponed that hearing in order to hear this violation first. As you can see from their record, um, and I am joined by Dante Summers, who's a manager. He was not present at the time, but once he learned of it uh, the next morning, uh, he took corrective action uh, and fired uh, the seller and also had his entire staff alcohol management certified at that time. Um, he he uh, gave copies of these alcohol certificates to the inspector, so they may or may not have earned, uh, ended up in your file. He's got some pictures on his, on his phone but his testimony is that he's had no less than five employees alcohol management certified since this event. Um, this place, it's in Curtis Bay. It has a it has a record. Um, it's not known for kids, that, you know, as a, as a young place for people to drink. And so they haven't had a, a 401A since 2013. Uh, they have a gambling charge. They were in here a couple months ago when a person came in and shot another person right on the bar stool. But that's it. Um, it's, as I say, it's not a great record, but as far as 
selling to minors. That's not been a big problem for them. And again, um, you know, I guess one of these things is I urge you to um, keep this license alive so that it can get new management, so that it have a new licensee, somebody who's younger, somebody I've met, somebody who's younger and has uh, uh, a little more uh, ability to administer um, the functions of the business properly and be compliant with the laws. So on that, I thank you. Okay. Commissioners have questions? No questions. No questions. All right. Thank you. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents, um, the admission uh, and the proffer from counsel, I find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a on April 9, 2019, in light of uh, the record and uh, the other considerations that were suggested to the board. I'd impose a $1,500 fine and give them 30 days to pay. I too find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a sales to minors on April 9, 2019, and I concur with the imposition of a $1,500 fine. I find a violation of Rule 4.01 a and agree with the uh, imposition of the $1,500 fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. I close it for the record. Board Exhibit 1, Baltimore State Police Department Report, Detective Greenhill. The point 525-29 East Patapsco Avenue, Class BD7, Beer, Wine, and Liquor License, here for violation of Rule 4.01, small a, sales to minors on April the 9th, 2019. Please come forward. For all those who are going to testify, please raise your right hand. What are your names, folks? My name is Dixon Borti. I'm the owner. Okay, and ma'am, you are? I'm Jenny Bamba. I'm the manager. Okay. Um, B A M B A. So you're charged with a sale to a minor on April 9th. Do you admit or deny that? Admit. Okay. You want to tell us what happened that night? Um, I wasn't at a location that very day, as so well as. So, okay, ma'am, maybe you can tell us. Uh, actually, I was not there as well. Um, I'm part of the promoting part of the bar, so at that particular time, I was on a pool team at another location bar. Um, but I can't speak on her behalf based off of what she told me happened that night. Okay. And she did admit that two young men came in and sat at the bar, but she also had a few excuses that she was busy, you know, it was a pool night, the pool teams was there, and she did serve the two young men that came in the bar that night. Um, but she had only been working for us for two months, so she hadn't been with us that long. And since then, we also um, sent her to the alcohol awareness to make her more aware about serving to minors and looking properly at IDs and, and making a request. Had I been there, I tend to know my staff pretty well, and that might have been something that I could have picked up on. I do mingle in in my off hours at the bar, and I do tend to, you know, commute, with, I mean, conversate with the customers, and I would have asked, had I been there, if he looked suspicious to me that they were young cadets coming in that night. And you have um, her carding also, all young people now? Huh? You have her carding all young people now? Uh, oh, definitely. Before then, I just think she just didn't think about doing so that particular night. Um, we only been in the establishment for 18 months, and this is our first violation. That's correct. Um, we are so new to the bar business, so we still learning a lot of things and making sure that our staff is just as informed as well. Um, we've been through a lot of staffs <laughs> since we've been there, but we do let them be there for a while before we um, spend out unnecessary money because we want to get them certified, but we want to make sure they're going to stay with us as well. Well, they may not learn all of our rules and regulations right away, but carding is an easy one. So yes. Right, right. right. You can right. teach them that yeah. one day. Right. Definitely. Okay. Right. Um, commissioners have questions? No questions. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, ma'am? No. All right. Thanks. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, uh, including the admission, I would find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a on April 9, 2019. It is your first offense. I'd impose a $500 fine and I'd give you 30 days to pay. I too find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a sales to minors on April 9, 2019, and I concur with the imposition of $500 fine. I join my colleagues and find a vi <coughs> violation of Rule 4.01 a, and we concur with the uh, imposition of a $500 fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That calls us for the record. Board is at the one, Baltimore City Police Department report, Detective Elsie Greenhill.
Belvedere Plaza Liquors, 565A, the Alameda, Class A, beer, wine, and liquor license, here for violation of Rule 4.01, small a, sales to minors on May the 7th, 2019. Please come forward. Belvedere Plaza Liquors, 5658 The Alameda, Class A, Beer, Wine, and Liquor License, here for violation of Rule 4.01, small a, sales to minors on May the 7th, 2019. Please come forward. With all those who are going to testify, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony of Joe Deputy Jim Messier and will do the truth? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony of Joe Deputy Jim Messier and will do the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Who is the owner? Cheese. Ma'am, what is your name? Kanchan. Can you come up to the mic? Kanchan Patil. How do you spell it? Uh, can I do that K for her? Because yes, you may. Okay, thank you. K A N C H A N B E N. Last name is Patil. Okay. My name is Nikunj. N I K U N J K U M A R. Last name is Patil. Okay. Ms. Patel, you were charged with a sale to a minor on May 7th. Do you admit or deny that that happened? Admit. Okay. Mr. Patel, do you want to explain to us what happened on that evening? Um, yes, sir. Um, I was, I, I'm there almost every day. And that day, that particular day, I had the doctor appointment. So I had to request one of my friend to work for me, which, which is he come from Charles County. So he came and he's kind of new to the liquor and I guess that was a bad day for him, and he got that ticket to sell the minors. But we also we always make sure, like we check the ID every time. But that's the only time he doesn't know anything. And, and so, uh, are you the one who usually does the serving? No, not me. Oh. That was a friend of mine, like who I request. No, I don't mean that night, but I mean gen generally, who's who's yeah, serving? Yeah, you? Okay. Yeah. And you're are you certified? Yes, I. Okay. Commissioners have questions? No questions. No questions. Were they cooperative with you? Yes. Okay, thank you. On the basis then of the materials containing the charging documents, testimony received, and the admission, I find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a on May 7, 2019. This is also your first offense, so I would impose a $500 fine and give you 30 days to pay. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I too find a violation of Rule 4.01 small a sales to minors on May 7, 2019, and given that this is your first offense, I concur with the imposition of a $500 fine. I find a violation of Rule 4.01A and would concur with the imposition of a $500 fine. Thank you. Thank you. Are the close for the record? What is it, the one? Bomber State Police Department report. Detective L.C. Greenhill. <clears throat> L&M Liquors, 1148 East North, East North Avenue. Class A, beer, wine, and liquor license, here for violation of Rule 4.01, small a, sales to minors on May the 7th, 2019. Please come forward. All those who are going to testify, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Mr. Maslin, you and represent them? Yes, we represent the uh, licensees. This would be an admission. Okay. Do you want to tell us what happened? Sure. Um, uh, this is licensee Hockley. His father used to have this this, this business for many years. His father has passed away. Um, he takes care of his mother, who has uh, is, is is disabled, and his sister, who also is uh, suffers from a disability. She's never had a job in her life outside of working in the uh, family business in in the in, in the liquor store. Uh, she had significant problems, developmental problems, which I don't want to get into, but um, resulted in some hospitalizations at times. But he takes care of his sister. But Mr. Lee, when did your di father die? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. So you've been in charge since 2017? 16. 16? Okay. The father had difficulties managing the, the, the premises, transferred it to his son. Um, since the, he's responsible for taking care not of his mother or sister, he takes his sister to work with him every day. Uh, in the course of the employment, he gets tired occasionally and wants to lie down. He's there from open to close. It's just him and his sister. 
when he lays down, he allows his sister, who he's trained to card and ask for ID, and she normally does, does that, and she functions well. I talked with her, and she indicated to me she believed the gentleman to be over, over 21. Most of the people they know in, in the area is the cadet here. Is that, is that the cadet? This another tall fellow. <laughs> like a basketball player. Uh, she believed them to be over, over 21. She, she, she's um, from Korea, and Korea tall people are normally older than shorter people. Uh, so she, she believed that him to be. You mean uh, you grow as age. you get older? I yeah, might have to yes, move you, then. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you get older as you get older. It's the growth factor. Uh, so she, she feels very sorry about that, and he's admonished his, his sister, and um, he's, he said he's, he's not going to try to to, to rest at work and make sure that he's got an eye on things uh, at all at all times. Uh, okay, uh, commissioners have questions. Were they cooperative? Yes. I have a question. I just I I don't know what I mean. I feel for the licensee. I really do. I just this is a really bad record. Right. And that, that's my, I I don't know how you balance that, but I do feel terrible given the circumstances. Uh, just for what it's worth, I don't, I don't know what. To, a bad record. Okay, I, 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 I can appreciate that. I, I, I understand that, but I just maybe you could temper the fines. It's it's not a high volume store at all. It's a very um, it's in a very tough area also, right on North Avenue. Okay, thank you. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, as well as the admission, I find a violation of Rule 4.01 Small A on May 7, 2019. Since young Mr. Lee's taken over, this is the third sale to minor, and I recognize the circumstances here are a bit extenuating, uh, but we've got to make sure that everyone is carded. Um, so I would, and there have been a lot of fines, and they haven't brought it. I, I'd impose a $2,000 fine. I'd give them 30 days to pay. I concur. Um, I, too, find a violation of Rule 4.01 uh, sales to minors on May 7, 2019. I concur with the imposition of a $2,000 fine, but I'm last time they were before us, uh, you know, we, uh, I was not inclined to give a suspension at that time. Um, however, I'm inclined to give a suspension at this time, a two-day suspension. Find a violation of Rule 4.01A. I um, I'll concur with uh, Commissioner Hafey with a $2,000 fine and a two-day suspension. When does it start? Today. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. You can make that start on Monday rather than today. It's up to them. On you, you said can start on Monday rather than today. Commissioner Greenfield, I mean, if you're fine with it, I'm fine with it. Uh, that's fine with me. All right, that, so you'd start on Monday. All right, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Page. Is that our docket? Monday, Monday closed Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. right. Thank you. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. The board is in recess until 11 a.m. Thursday, July the 18th, 2019. We are Thank adjourned. You.